It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Parents and students are anxiously watching the news about Ontario schools this week and looking for a government that's ready to work with educators in our classrooms. Yet for the last year, the Premier has relentlessly attacked teachers, even referring to them as union thugs. The government refused to apologize for those remarks, Speaker, when given a chance earlier this year. So I'm asking the Minister now, uh, does he think that the Premier's comments were acceptable? Questions addressed to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, it is the Premier and every member of this team that values our frontline workers, our teachers, our nurses, our doctors, those who have value to improve the quality of life of every citizen in this country. It's why, Mr. Speaker, today, part of an announcement I made today, this morning, to encourage all parties to turn to mediation so that we can ensure we get a deal for the children of this province, so we can ensure that kids remain in class. Mr. Speaker, under the QP deal, we turned to mediation. It was a prudent tool. A non, uh, it was an independent uh, point of contact that helped bring the parties together, bridge the gap, and get a good deal for all parties. We seek to rep rep replicate that with our teachers, because at the end of the day, our focus for this government is keeping kids in class. The supplementary question. Speaker, I dare say if the minister was serious, he would be actually offering mediation straight to the unions and not through the media. That would be the respectful thing to do, Speaker. Most Ontarians respect the work done by teachers in the classroom, but for the last year, the Premier of Ontario has really only been insulting them. He's blamed them for the failures of his own policies. Last spring, when the students across the province walked out of the classrooms to protest the government's education cuts, the Premier claimed that they were ordered to do so by their teachers. Yeah. And he stuck by that claim even when students came out here at, to Queen's Park to tell them that he was wrong. Does the minister think that this is the way to build a a respectful relationship, and if not, will he apologize on behalf of the government that he serves under for the Premier's comments and his actions? Again, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the objective of this government since day one was to land voluntary settlements with all unions to ensure the children of this province remain in class. Today, we offered mediation because both to the unions but also uh, to the public, because we want families to know that it is our government is going to be constructive, remain mission focused on getting deals. Mr. Speaker, when we faced an impasse with CUPE, it was the government and the parties that turned to a mediator, an, an independent third party, that was able to bring the parties together and get a good settlement, a settlement that helped us achieve the objectives we sought, as well as ensuring we reinvested more monies in the front line that had over 1,000 frontline workers hired in this province. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to negotiate in good faith with all unions to get deals for the children of this province. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, something about negotiating through the media actually— Order. Something about negotiating through the media actually belies this minister's uh, ass assertion that he is respectfully negotiating, Speaker. For over a year, the Premier has made it clear he was spoiling for a fight with the women and men who teach our kids. He called them union thugs. He claimed they secretly ordered the high school student walkouts across Ontario last spring. He even blamed them when he was booed at public events. These aren't the actions of a leader or a government who want to work productively with teachers in the classroom. So can the minister tell us, why has the Premier worked so hard to pick a fight with our educators? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. To the member opposite, in fact, the Premier and every member of the government is working hard to get deals for the children of this province. And, Mr. Speaker, the reason why today we've turned to mediation is because we've accepted that of the critical few issues that remain at the table, that we want to utilize the talents of a mediator, a third party, or, who can help bring the, the parties together to get a voluntary settlement. And, Mr. Speaker, every objective we have achieved so far through this process has been focused in good faith bargaining. One union, in specific, has actually opted to publicize the offers table. That has been the decision of OSSTF, not the government. But obviously, our commitment is to negotiate in good faith with one mission in mind, a good deal that keeps children in this province in class. Thank you.
The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Education Minister. It's not just the Premier's words that are concerning parents and students, Speaker. It's his actions. One of his first acts as Premier was to put a plan in place to fire 10,000 teachers. And despite months of denial, that plan Order. is actually still in place. The Premier claimed that he consulted thousands of educators and students about their hopes for education. So my question is, how many teachers were consulted about the Ford government's plan to take 10,000 jobs away, and how many parents asked for more crowded classrooms? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, parents of this province have asked us overwhelmingly to do everything we can to keep children in class. That is the issue that the member opposite chooses to avoid. Mr. Speaker, 100 per cent of families want this government to be constructive, student-centric, and to get deals. And we adopted that approach with CUPE, where we worked in good faith, notwithstanding the deadline bargaining, notwithstanding the natural ebb and flow and the frustrations from those observing. We got a deal, and we seek to do that with our teachers. What is frustrating, Mr. Speaker, for families is that every three years, they have to face the cyclical and omnipresent reality of labour strife, where their children may not be in class on Monday. That is unacceptable. We want a deal that provides predictability to the people of this province. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, if the, uh, if the minister were actually listening to the advice of parents, as he claims, he wouldn't be negotiating through the media uh, by suggesting that, uh, uh, that mediation should happen to the public as opposed to talking to the unions directly. Yeah. Students and parents are looking to government to support excellent public schools that will allow kids to thrive. But for the last year, the Premier has been tearing down the people who make those schools work while making deep cuts in the classroom. After unilaterally imposing classroom cuts that no one asked for, the government unilaterally and unconstitutionally imposed a salary cap. How can the Ford government make unilateral classroom cuts, unconstitutional intrusions into bargaining, call teachers' name, bargain through the media, and have the brass to, complain, uh, to claim rather, that they are not looking for a fight with teachers? The Minister of Education again. Mr. Speaker, we seek a resolution with our teachers because we value their work. Mr. Speaker, it was this government that opted in the last budget to allocate over $1.5 billion to ensure teachers remain in class. It was this government who announced in this most recent economic statement another $200 million more, the highest investment ever recorded in the history of this province under this progressive conservative government. Mr. Speaker, it was this government that more than doubled the funding envelope for mental health. It is this government that hired nearly 200 psychologists and psychotherapists for, high school, for uh, secondary schools. It's this government that is revamping our math curriculum, going back to basics. We're focused on student success, and we're not going to be deterred. We're going to focus on keeping kids in class, and we hope every member of this legislature would stand with the government, stand with parents in achieving that objective. The final supplementary. Well, this, this minister knows very well that with uh, taking into consideration student population growth and inflation, his raw numbers really mean nothing. Right. The last year has been tough for parents and students, however, st uh, Speaker. They've already seen layoffs for teachers and education workers. Expanded class sizes are a reality. The elimination of thousands of high school classes have taken place, and programs like full-day kindergarten are put at risk. Instead of working with the teachers and education workers who make our schools work, the Premier has called them names. Parents and students across Ontario deserve so much better than that, Speaker. Is the government going to start undoing the damage, or are they going to continue with the Premier's agenda of cuts in the classroom and picking fights with the educators who make our schools work? Again, the Minister of Education, reply. Mr. Speaker, this government is going to invest in the students of this province. We are on track, Mr. Speaker, this year to spend more than $1.2 billion more than we did last year. We're investing $200 million more in this economic statement announced by the Minister sure. of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we're doing all of this, more expenditure for health and education and the services that are so consequential to the lives of our families while keeping taxes low and on track to return to balance. This is a plan for every person in this province where the next generation will not have to bur be burdened by the last generation's transfer of debt. Mr. Speaker, we believe that by investing in children, by investing in education, we build an, a society where everyone could achieve their potential, get access to a good job, and be able to contribute to this country's development. Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning, parents uh, heard more concerning news about talks with teachers and disruption in our schools. My question is to the Minister of Education. 
For months, the Premier has done his utmost to pick a fight with teachers in the classroom. And today, instead of backing down from their cuts, the minister goes to a press conference and tries to blame anyone but the Premier himself who started this fight. Bargaining was literally bargaining with OSSTF was literally delayed today because the minister had to hold yet another press conference. Why is the government more focused on escalating tensions and trying to avoid blame instead of working toward a solution? Again, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, thank you and thank you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, I often reflect as a student of history on what is the common denominator in this experience. What unites Premier Bobre, Mike Harris, Ernie Eves, Kathleen Wynne, Dalton McGuinty, and now Doug Ford? Is the commonality, the ideology, or the value statement, or the party? or the fact that in each and every example, unions have opted to escalate. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, our mission, our practice, Order. our practice is to focus Order. on getting deals. We have, seen this, we have seen this story before, and the objective of the government is to say to families, we will do everything within our toolkit to get deals. Mr. Speaker, today I opted to turn to mediation, encouraging the members of the union and the trustees to consider it as a viable path to get deals. It is a constructive option, it is a third-party option, and it has worked for Q just weeks ago. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I would encourage the, the minister to go back to history class, but it's probably being cut under his government. Our teachers, students, and families all deserve government better side, come to order. than the cuts and the chaos that this government is serving up. Their cuts have rolled back opportunities for our students to succeed and created a crisis in our schools. Catholic teachers today describe chaos, chaos at the bargaining table with a government changing teams and proposals mid-negotiation. Instead of working with teachers in good faith to fix this mess, they're going to the press trying to avoid blame. When will the government reverse their cuts to education and start fixing the damage instead of exacerbating tensions? The Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, and, and to the member opposite, what Order. I will affir affirm to the member opposite is that since day one, we have done everything we can to get a deal. When QP, when we face challenges with our negotiated with our partners in QP, we offered more dates. We turned to a mediator. We did everything we can to be constructive because families in this province deserve to know that there are forces at the table that are going to fight to keep their kids in classrooms every day. And Mr. Speaker, it is not an abstraction, it's not theory, it is a real a reality that we got a deal overwhelmingly ratified with QP by advancing that mission of keeping kids in class and investing in the front lines. We seek to do that again with our teachers. We value their contributions. We know that they work hard and we want to keep them in class too working. That's why we're going to do everything we can to work with our parties, including a mediator, to get a deal. I would hope that all parties will look to an independent Response. third party with promise that it can help reach deals that keep all of our constituents' children in class. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. The people of Durham and all across Ontario expect us to work towards and take measures that ensure clean air, clean water, and an environment that's protected across this province for future generations. I know that's one of the guiding principles the minister used in developing his proposal, the Better for People, Smarter for Business package. Would the minister please tell me how the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act is ensuring the environment is protected for future generations? The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Durham. I know the member for Durham cares deeply about the environment and is always looking for ways to, to work together with industry and others to ensure that our environment is protected for the future generations of this province. And Mr. Speaker, the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, we're taking a thoughtful, sensible, targeted approach to fixing Ontario's broken regulatory framework. One of the guiding principles of this government, while easing regulatory burdens has been maintaining a clear focus on protecting and safeguarding Ontario's environment. Smarter regulation is not at odds with this priority, Mr. Speaker. When operating properly, these principles go hand in hand. 
That's why our package, for instance, proposes to expand the use of administrative monetary penalties for environmental violations in order to hold polluters accountable. Spons? The broader use of administrative monetary penalties will allow the government to take swift action against illegal activity. All right. All right. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his work on this file. You know, it's not good enough to just have laws on the books without any consequence for violations. And so I'm really pleased to hear that the minister has been thoughtful in his approach to protecting our environment for future generations. I would like to ask the minister to be a bit more specific. Can you tell me how you've proposed to hold those who commit environmental violations accountable? Good the associate minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right now, only 140 facilities in this province can be fined for violations through administrative monetary penalties. Wow. The Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, if passed, will increase that number to up to 150,000 facilities in the province. Mr. Speaker, we're strengthening enforcement and adding new tools so that if a company is breaking the rules and making and benefiting financially from doing so, not only will they be fined under this new system, they will be charged for the economic benefit as well and could be further referred for uh, prosecution. We've made it much tougher on environmental violators, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing through this package is adding yet another tool for environmental officers to do Spons? the important work of safeguarding our environment on behalf of all Ontarians and protecting our future generations. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. I uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, as the Attorney General knows or should know, judicial appointments are lifetime appointments, and keeping the appointment process fair and impartial is vitally important to the justice system. But last week, the Attorney General revealed that the Ford government is planning changes to the judicial appointments process. And to quote one legal expert, the reason is obvious. He said, quote, they want a bunch of names so they can look down and find a nice soul, soulmate Tory, end quote. Speaker, why is this government trying to change the appointments process to make it easier to hire their friends? The question is to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I was expecting the question because I read the papers this morning, and the papers actually talked about the announcement that I made last week in a speech, so no shock Peter. at all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can, I can tell you, I hear over and over again about our justice system and how we can always do better. And this is not a notion that I came to in the last couple of months. Thirty years ago, I was working training new judges on how to do paperwork. I've probably dealt with more judges than anybody else in this chamber. And then I did a master's in judicial administration and public administration for courts, Mr. Speaker. And then I did a law degree, Mr. Speaker. And then I worked in the, in, in the judicial system for several, several years. Mr. Order. Speaker, I can tell you, legal aid, I took legal aid certificates. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Thank Speaker. Well Mr. Speaker, I can tell Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll have more to say in my supplementary. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. As we just saw with the minister's response, we've seen with the Ford government in action, and we know they like to give jobs to their friends, relatives, and insiders. Whether it's hiring a 26-year-old lacrosse-playing buddy of the Premier's chief of staff to a six-figure job in Manhattan, or trying to install the Premier's friend as chief of staff or chief of the Ontario Pol Provincial Police, rather, or firing the acting commissioner of the OPP Order. when he had the courage the courage to blow the whistle. We know that this government can't be trusted to run a fair appointments process. Speaker, the judicial appointments process is working well. Why is the Attorney General trying to change that? The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is so much more that we need to do. And I'm, I'm drawing on my experience as an executive member on the Ontario Bar Association, on my volunteer time with the Law Society of Ontario. I'm consulting with former Attorney Generals. I've talked to several former Attorney Generals, both federally and provincially. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, there is so much more we can do to make our system even better. And, Mr. Speaker, this suggestion, the suggestion that we would not be able to improve the system that we need what we need. Mr. Speaker, if you look at these young pages, these young pages around us, that was me when this system was brought in. Things change. We need to modernize. Here, here. We need to move here, forward. Here. We need to attract the best. Here, here.
Next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the uh, Deputy Premier. Uh, for months and even years now, uh, the husband of one of uh, the government caucus members, uh, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, has consistently been viciously attacking members of the Francophone community, making hateful and racist comments. Just recently, he targeted a Francophone reporter mocking his French nationality. I could reference so many examples, but here's just one. He posted online that the president of the leading organization had his nose up in a specific body part of the uh, former French language uh, commissioner. Body part that. I ask the member to take her seat. The question has to be about government policy. Could the member rephrase her question? That's related to a caucus member's position. Uh, Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Will the member please take her seat? Have to be able to hear the member? Once again, the question has to be about government policy. I'll give you a chance to rephrase your question and put it. For that. Okay. We're going to move on. The next question. The next question. The member for Niagara West. Thank you very much. My question is for the Minister of Health. Over the past 15 years in Ontario, we have seen the problem of hallway health care grow and grow. And I'm proud of our government's plan to end hallway health care. The previous government, supported by the NDP, ignored the problems with our public health care system. And it was especially true of the problems faced by small and medium hospitals. We recently announced increased funding for hospital operations across Ontario to help address this, these many years of neglect. Speaker, can the minister tell this House about the investments our government is making to end hallway health care across this province? Questions to the Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Niagara West for the question. The member is quite right. The previous government failed to address changing demographics and prepare our hospitals for the pressures that they are currently facing. Ending hallway health care takes smart investments in our public health care system and a relentless focus on patient care. That's why our government made a $68 million in-year in investment for hospital stabilization and relief. This is in addition to the $384 million more that Ontario hospitals have already received this year. This investment addresses problems with the funding formula that saw small and medium-sized hospitals shortchanged for years. This government will continue on our path to end hallway health care and work with patients, families and frontline providers to build a sustainable public health care system for years to come. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'd also like to thank the Minister for her work for hospitals across Ontario, including my riding of Niagara West. The previous government's funding formula saw small and medium hospitals lose out on the operational funding they needed. But our government invested $68 million, and I know this will make a significant impact in small communities like Brockville, Owen Sound, Hawkesbury, communities across Ontario. Speaker, hallway health care is a very complex issue and one that no one single solution will fix. But it's why our government has a plan to tackle hallway health care that will encompass many different factors. Could the minister tell the House a little bit more about our government's plan to tackle hallway health care for my constituents and all citizens across Ontario? Again, the Minister of Health. And as the member mentioned, hallway health care is a very complex issue and one that's going to take a comprehensive plan to fix. As part of our plan, we will place a focus on health promotion to keep Ontarians healthy and out of hospital. <laughs> Understanding that hospitals aren't always the best place for people to receive care, we are also working to ensure that access to the right care is available in the right place to all Ontarians, regardless of where they live. We are also better integrating care to improve patient flow and ensure patients who are ready to leave the hospital can return home with the supports and services that they need. Finally, by investing $27 billion over 10 years in hospital infrastructure projects, we will build capacity throughout the system, including in our hospitals and in other community-based care facilities. Response. Speaker, we made a commitment to the people of Ontario that we would end hallway health care, and our plan is well on its way to doing that. Thank you. The 
next question. Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Acting Premier and through you. Today, the Toronto Star is reporting something that residents of Tottenham have known for years. Their tap water is contaminated with dangerous chemicals, including trihalomethanes, which are linked to pregnancy complications, cancers, damage to the heart, liver, and central nervous system. What's worse, Mr. Speaker, these documents show the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks has known about this contamination for years, Speaker. The Liberals knew about it, the Conservatives knew about it, and no one has done anything. How could the government let this happen? The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. To the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite uh, for that question. And uh, uh, just to add to the record, the correspondence uh, between 2017 with between the MECP and, and the municipality uh, shows that the province advised the township to address its uh, uh, halomethane problem with additional treatment measures and operational practices. Uh, the letter from, was from District Manager Cindy Hood. The proposed strategies from the ministry were considered but eliminated by the township for various reasons. The ministry provided recommendations, which are not a legal requirement. Uh, we hopefully the municipality has taken the proper actions going forward. But, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you one thing: that the water systems across this province are in good, excellent shape. Uh, we Once. hope we will continue to work with the town to ensure that the water is going forward. I'll have more to say on the uh, supplemental on further what's going on in the area. The supplementary question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, for more than 15 years, politicians and health officials in Ontario have known that the top water in Tottenham was unsafe, and yet they didn't feel it was necessary to let people know. And it's not just Tottenham. In 2016, more than 80 communities have exceeded the allowable guidelines for THM in Ontario, including North Bay, Innisfil, Kawartha Lakes, and Timmins, among others. The Liberals downloaded the cost of source water protection onto municipalities. The Conservatives have followed the same pattern, further cutting municipal and conservation authority funding. Why does the acting premier believe saving a buck is worth getting people sick? Question has been referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Members, please take your seats. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the town will continue to monitor the THM levels in Tottenham drinking water by sampling in accordance with the requirements of the Tottenham drinking water license. The town expects to be con begin construction in 2020 of a transmission main which will connect the Tottenham drinking water system to the Collingwood Allison pipeline. Construction expected to be completed by 2022. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the aeration system, the pipeline, uh, is also expected to help reduce THM formation in the Tottenham's drinking water, Mr. Speaker. We are working with the township. I can't answer for the previous government's inaction, but Mr. Speaker, we're putting action in, working with the town to ensure we clean up the water systems here, and we remain committed to ensuring Ontario has the highest standards of drinking water protection, and we'll continue to work with all our partners across Ontario with businesses. Uh, private owners, uh, residences, schools, indigenous Response. communities, Mr. Speaker, we will maintain Ontario's world-class drinking water system in this province. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, our government announced the Digital First Health Strategy. Speaker, Ontarians have been frustrated by a system that's incredibly outdated. We've all had to tell our stories over and over again to different doctors. We've had to carry around paper files or send information by fax, Mr. Speaker. It's time that we put an end to this kind of system. That's why our government is building comprehensive solutions to these problems and making a difference in the lives of patients. Can the minister tell this House how our Digital First for Health strategy will help Ontarians access the care they need? Good. The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for his question. Our government's Digital First for Health strategy brings the patient experience into the 21st century and helps end hallway health care by offering more choices and making health care simpler, easier, and more convenient for patients. This strategy will enable innovation in our health sector so that frontline care providers are provided 
access to better and more connected tools. Thanks to these changes, the new Ontario health teams will be able to use secure digital solutions to improve patient care. With the, patient, with the potential to reduce travel for patients in rural and remote communities, this phase of our strategy will also expand virtual care options so that patients will have the option of video visits from their care providers. Mr. Speaker, Response. when it comes to bringing Ontario's health care system into the 21st century, our system and our government is just getting started. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the Minister. The Digital First for Health strategy is addressing many long-standing issues with how care is delivered in this province. It is clear this plan will not only help, uh, help achieve a modern and fully connected health care system, but also help with reducing hallway health care. I am pleased that our government is continuing to make investments to expand digital health solutions that will achieve the real results that Ontarians have needed for so long. Mr. Speaker, with private sector data breaches becoming an increasingly common issue around the world, Ontarians are very concerned with the privacy of their information. Can the minister tell this House how the digital first for Ontario health strengthens, strengthens protections for Ontarians' medical information? Again, yeah, the Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And as part of this strategy, our government is strengthening the Personal Health Information Protection Act so that Ontarians can be confident that their medical records are going to be protected. Our government did engage with the Information and Privacy Commissioner as we developed this strategy, and we are very pleased that the Commissioner is supportive of the initial proposed changes. We are also introducing stricter, stricter penalties for misuse of personal inf health information, including creating new offences for re-identifying a person using their health information. Our government believes that patients must have control of their health information and private consent in how it is used and shared. Our digital first for health strategy is about harnessing the imagination and capabilities of Ontario's digital health innovators, while of course protecting the privacy of Ontarians. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last week, Ontario's Financial Accountability Office published its analysis of the Ministry of Transportation spending plan. The FAO found the government is planning a massive 40% cut to transit spending. How can this government keep its transit promises when this government is cutting funding for the province's transit capital plan by a massive 40%? The question is addressed to the Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we thank the Financial Accountability Officer for his report. As outlined in our budget in 2019, our government plans to spend $67 billion in transit over the next 10 wow. years. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a 10-year plan that reflects a realistic forecast of construction timelines for major projects planned or underway in keeping with actual expenditure patterns. The FAO report, Mr. Speaker, only focuses on a five-year time frame. I think everyone in this House knows that our government is making significant investments in transit infrastructure, like our multi-billion multi dollar commitment to get subways built in Toronto, and we have a realistic plan to deliver. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Minister of Transportation. The FAO found that not only did this government cut transit spending by 40 per cent, but it's cutting funding for Metrolinx by 36 per cent as well. Metrolinx has already made drastic cuts to GO bus service, because, and because of the government's funding cuts, this has left riders from Bolton to Oshawa stranded. Metrolinx has also hiked fares on the Union Pearson Express, and they plan to eliminate the GO TTC fare discount next month. So on paper, this government likes to make a lot of big ticket promises, but in reality, this government is making congestion worse by cutting service and hiking fares. How can this government say it's helping commutes when transit cuts are making congestion worse? Minister of Transportation. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Referred to the, minister, the Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. 
Thank you very much to the member for the question, and thank you to the minister for letting me address this. I think our government has been very clear over the last year and a half that we are committed to getting Ontarians moving. Mr. Speaker, we have made historic investments in public transit in the City of Toronto and in New York Region, spending $28.5 billion, uh, forming a partnership with the City of Toronto, getting the city moving again. Mr. Speaker. We have spent $30 billion across this province in infrastructure projects so that we can reach our two-way all-day go service, Mr. Speaker. We have improved all of the lines in our core key segments, including Niagara, Lakeshore East, Mr. Speaker, the Kitchener line, which we've in increased service by 48 percent, which I know my colleagues in this House are very happy about. Mr. Speaker, not to mention uh, uh, children 12 and under don't, uh, don't pay for the fees and, of course, bringing Wi-Fi to the GO network next year. Mr. Speaker, Response. public transit is a priority for this government, and we've made it very clear in this House. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, my past role is a critic for northern development in mines. I travelled around northern Ontario and saw the infrastructure needs across the region. I trust our government is working with the federal government, municipalities, community groups, indigenous groups and businesses to ensure, ensure important infrastructure projects move forward for the benefit of northern Ontarians. I recently noticed that our government is investing over $33 million in transit infrastructure for the city of Sudbury. Can the minister provide the House with details on these important investments for the people of Sudbury? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Perry Sand Muskoka for his great advocacy for the North because he's quite right. Our government is investing more than $33 million for transit infrastructure in cities like Sudbury. Sudbury asked for funding for their accelerated bus fleet replacement program. So Ontario is investing more than $11.5 million. In addition, we have committed more than $9 million for the design and construction of a major mobility hub for Greater Sudbury Transit. We're also putting more than $8.7 million towards the design of bus rapid transit corridors in the city, which together with additional investments in various technological improvements and traffic signal renewal will result in improved transit for the people of Sudbury. Sudbury officials told us these were their priority Response. projects, and we listened. That's why we're committing to more than $33 million in total transit infrastructure investment, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for confirming our government's commitment to investing in priority infrastructure for the people of Sudbury. Those are the kinds of investments that can really have a positive impact on the daily lives of families. But most of Northern Ontario doesn't have access to public transit. These areas need investments in roads and bridges to ensure people and products can travel safely around the North. So aside from the transit in the city of Sudbury, can the minister tell this House if there have been investments made in other Northern Ontario communities? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member is quite right. Our government is investing nearly $31 million in communities across northern Ontario, from Timmins to Algoma to Cochrane to James Bay, for road, for transit infrastructure projects. In Timmins, Ontario is investing close to $1 million for improved transit Order. infrastructure, including two improved accessibility and the purchase of two new low-floor accessibility paratransit. Mobility buses in Red Lake. We're investing more than $1.6 million for the rehabilitation of priority roadways. And in Pickle Lake, we are committing more than $1 million for the reconstruction of the Pickle Lake Road. Across Algoma, Manitoulin, we're putting more than $13.5 million in road, bridge, and airport infrastructure, which is crucial to Northern Ontario. Response. Municipal officials told us. These were priority projects, and our government listened, and I hope the official opposition supports us in this. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Incidents of racism in Ontario schools continues to be a growing concern for students, their families, and for teachers. Students deserve answers, and we know that empty words won't help students and families feel safe, welcome, and respected in their schools. 
Recently, the Minister of Education announced a review of the Peel District School Board in light of reports of anti-black racism that existed under the Liberals and persists under the Conservatives. The previous Liberal government spoke a lot of pretty words after hearing from concerned communities and took no concrete action. And this government has already cut funding from anti-racism initiatives that should fund initiatives just like this. Can the minister please provide details today outlining how students, teachers and families' concerns will be taken seriously this time? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you. I want to express my gratitude to the member opposite for the question. Uh, indeed, in this province, there is no tolerance for racism, for prejudice against any child. In the case of the Peel District School Board, as I've communicated with her over the weekend and with various members of the chamber and the opposition, that I take this seriously, and I find it unacceptable when serious allegations emerge of anti-black racism or racism that, um, that is targeting children, visible minorities, racialized students. That is unacceptable in this province and in this country. That's why, Mr. Speaker, almost immediately after finding out about these allegations being raised by the chair uh, and the vice chair, as well as one of the directors of education, I immediately took action by calling in two reviewers who will be bringing forth recommendations to me in the coming weeks on an expedited basis. Those reviewers will be in the schools and the boards in a matter of days and weeks. And more importantly, Speaker, it gives me the ability under the Act to impose recommendations Response. to improve equity and improve the experience of every child in the classroom in Peel and across the province. Supplementary, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister of Education. Since the ministry announced their review of the Peel District School Board due to the reports of anti-black racism, we've been hearing concerns from parents and students in Peel that this government will just file another report that will be swept under the rug. Racism in our schools cannot be tolerated, Mr. Speaker, and we all, we all have a responsibility to ensure that racialized students feel safe and welcome at their schools and in our communities. The minister promised this review would be transparent, but after promising no teacher would lose their job, this feels like cold comfort. Will the minister ensure that the review has the resources to fully investigate the culture of racism at the Peel District School Board and that a concrete plan of action and those recommendations will be made public? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to express my gratitude to the member for Brampton Centre for the question. Uh, it, look, at the, at the end of the day, Speaker, it is very clear that I think every member of this chamber does not accept any form of racism or discrimination for any reason. And the anti-black racism and the allegations that have emerged in Peel, I've spoken to both members on this side of the chamber from Brampton, all members from Mississauga, and the members opposite. And in each and every uh, communication, I've made clear that we have called in the reviewers with one mission, which is to investigate systemic allegations and circumstances of bias and prejudice and to root it out with recommendations that will be made public, that will come to my table this year, that I will impose on the board this year to ensure every child feels more safe, more welcomed and included in the classrooms of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Landbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this is also to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, bullying is a painful reality for the majority of Canadian children and youth, and whether they are the ones that are being bullied or the ones being aggressive towards others, students may find talking to adults about bullying difficult, even though adult intervention is the key to bullying prevention. In 2001, Ontario designated the week beginning the third Sunday of November as Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week. Eighteen years later, the goal of promoting safe schools and a positive learning environment is more important than ever. We know that the longer a child is bullied, the more likely they are to develop physical, emotional and psychological scars that can last a lifetime. Can the Minister of Education please tell the Legislature and the government what it's doing to address bullying in our schools? Questions question addressed to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her leadership in Hamilton and across the province in raising awareness to combat bullying in all of its forms. Mr. Speaker, indeed it is Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week, and I think all members of this House speak with one voice in the denouncement of this form of increasing violence that could target young kids, increasing form of hate and discrimination. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, in this province, we have a zero-tolerance policy, and I believe that there are too many examples and too many circumstances of young women and men emerging with stories and their narratives being told of them feeling that the system has not been responsive to their needs. 
And today and in the coming days, I'll be making further steps, more announcements that we can take to improve enforceability, improve training and supports for these children and victims of bullying, and ensure that there's accountability against those who perpetrate these types of uh, heinous activities. Mr. Speaker, we're going to work every single day, work across party lines Response. to ensure every student in this province is safe from bullying. Supplementary, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Minister, for your response. We know that bullying can have serious effects on kids', kids mental health, and tragically, as we have seen recently, it can have fatal consequences. I was pleased to join you, Minister, on October 12th at CAM 8, together with Natalie Pierre from my riding of Burlington, for your announcement on mental health education. That day, you provided Natalie the opportunity to share the story of her son, Mike, a grade 12 Corpus Christi High School student who, in 2017, sadly took his own life. Minister, can you please give this legislature some concrete examples of the actions our government has taken to address bullying? Question. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to again thank the member from Burlington uh, for her leadership and for introducing me to Natalie Pierre, who is an incredibly courageous woman who tragically lost her son. And it is for Mike, for that young man, and it is for so many other victims of bullying uh, in isolation that we speak united today to say bullying must end in this province. Mr. Speaker, in our government, we announced a health and physical education curriculum that in the earliest years of grade three starts to remove the visible and invisible differences in the eyes of our young people. We are trying to change the culture in the classroom so people appreciate the inherent dignity of every person, irrespective of faith, heritage, orientation, or place of birth. Mr. Speaker, we've invested money to support our principals on de-escalation training, more resources for our teachers, more supports for our victims. And Mr. Speaker, there's more to do to strengthen enforcement, strengthen data collection, to understand how pervasive the problem is. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to take additional support to support victims Response. of these crimes. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Once again, the flu season is upon us. Despite everyone's best effort, many people are getting sick. This government, Bill 47, will allow employers to request sick notes before workers can go back to work. We've seen this movie before, Speaker. The majority of Ontarians feel forced to go to work sick rather than get a sick note. Getting a sick note for a minor illness is not quality care, much to the opposite. People going to work sick spread their disease. People getting a sick note will often be in a waiting room spreading their germs to often frail, sick people around them. Will the acting premier reverse the decision regarding sick notes for minor illnesses? Questions addressed to the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Labour. Referred to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I'm proud to stand up uh, every day uh, in the House to talk about our record in the last 16 months uh, when it comes to standing shoulder to shoulder with workers uh, right across this province. Mr. Speaker, uh, we've created in 16 months over a quarter of a million new jobs in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest unemployment rate in nearly three decades today, thanks to the measures that our government has put in place. And Mr. Speaker, uh, wages are going up uh, in the province of Ontario, and uh, the one thing that I've yet to hear uh, the NDP uh, compliment this government on, and the one policy that I'm most proud of as Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that in 2019, people earning under $30,000 per year in the province of Ontario will pay zero income Response. tax. Supplementary question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this Premier promised to end hallway medicine, but first he cancelled the two days sick leave. Now he's forcing people to get sick notes for minor illnesses, actions that are going in the opposite direction. They are making hallway medicine worse when workers feel they have no choice but to go to work, potentially making others ill. Speaker, will this government listen to healthcare professionals who overwhelmingly agree that asking people to get a sick note for a minor illness is not only a waste of resources, it is dangerous. Will the Acting Premier reverse the provision of Bill 47? Questions to the Minister of Labour, 
training and skills development. Well, thank you uh, again very much, Mr. Speaker. As the member opposite knows, um, this is uh, not mandatory, it's optional. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we uh, assumed uh, office uh, after 15 years of reckless decisions uh, made by the Liberal government of the day, uh, supported by the NDP. Mr. Speaker, 300,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs were obliviated, sent south of the border, sent to other places around the world, Mr. Speaker, because of the decisions of the Liberal and NDP parties uh, in those 15 years. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said in the first question, Order. in 16 months, Mr. Speaker, over a quarter of a million new jobs have been created in the province of Ontario. Wages are going up. Unemployment is at uh, a 30-year low in the province of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, Response? again, those making $30,000 a year or less will pay no income tax in Ontario. The next question is the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Since we're taking office, we have been working to make this province open for business while maintaining the rules that keep people healthy and safe. Our government has shown what it means to truly put the people at the center of every decision that we have. It is the spirit that the history of hardworking men and women in Ontario should be shared with everyone in our province. Can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to promote the history of labor in Ontario? Minister of Labor, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member uh, from Richmond Hill for that excellent and important question. Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure to share with the member in this House that Archives of Ontario has launched a new online exhibit titled Ontario at Work. This exhibit commemorates the 100th anniversary of the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Since taking on this new portfolio uh, in June, Mr. Speaker, I've had the opportunity to meet now with over 150 labour leaders across the province, uh, many business leaders and countless uh, workers in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, with every conversation, I learn uh, something new about labour and the diverse workplaces we have right across Ontario. As our government lays the groundwork for a safer, fairer and more harmonious future, I encourage everyone to Response. visit this new exhibit. I encourage everyone to visit ontario.ca forward slash archives. The supplementary question. Congratulations, Minister, on the launch of this new exhibit and thank you for your answer. Mr. Speaker, our government making the province open for jobs. Businesses and labour in my riding of Richmond Hill has benefited a lot from it. Jobs in Ontario and around the world have certainly changed a lot over the past 100 years. I'm sure that the opportunity to look back at the past will be intriguing and insightful as we prepare for the future. This journey through the history gives us knowledge and never had before. Can a minister please tell us more about this exhibit and what it means for the people in Ontario? Again, Minister of Labour. Well, thank you again to the member of Richmond Hill for that question. Mr. Speaker, this exhibit shows three principles that I firmly believe. First, it demonstrates that a safety-first approach is both good for workers and good for the bottom line. Second, it makes clear that stable and constructive labour relations supports a competitive and sustainable provincial economy. And third, Mr. Speaker, it illustrates the role of the Minister of Labour to be fair to workers and responsible to taxpayers. I'm proud to note, Mr. Speaker, that 98 per cent of labour negotiations are resolved without disruption, and Ontario is a leader in health and safety. Since we formed government, our province has 256,200 brand new jobs, unemployment is down, and wages are up. Mr. Speaker, make no mistake. We're building Ontario together. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. In the premier's very first budget, he cut one billion dollars from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services for people who depend on support from the ministry, particularly those with developmental disabilities such as autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and fetal, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This was devastating news after 15 years of underfunding and neglect by the Liberals. 
But now we've learned that this Conservative government isn't listening to families, but they are willing to pay up to $1 million for a consultant to tell them how to carry out these deep cuts to programs that support people with developmental disabilities. Will the acting premier explain why they continue to purposefully force people with disabilities to bear the brunt of their short-sighted cuts? Questions addressed to the deputy premier. To the minister of children, community, and social services. Referred to the minister of children, community, and social services. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Everything about that question uh, was counterfactual, Mr. Speaker. It just was not true. I can ask the minister to withdraw. I'll withdraw that, Mr. Speaker. Fine. Mr. Speaker, um, as the member knows, there is a growing demand uh, for developmental services right across the province. I've actually sat at a table uh, with the member opposite in her own riding of Windsor West, meeting with families myself. Our ministry has taken to the streets, we have taken to every community across the province, and we will be continuing to meet with those who are involved in the sector. Families, children who are affected, We'll be meeting with those who provide the services, Mr. Speaker. It's the government that will be doing that. Response. Certainly, we know we can do better in this sector. After 10 years of zero investment in this sector by the previous Liberal government, she was right about that, Mr. Speaker. We've got a lot of work to do. We're going to work together with the member opposite to make sure. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Actually, the minister did come to Windsor and he sat across the table from families and individuals with developmental disabilities as they cried and begged for help. And yet he still chooses to spend a million dollars on a consultant to cut the services and supports they need. People with developmental disabilities and their families are worried sick about these drastic cuts. The programs that Conservatives are looking to cut provide crucial supports like respite, day programs and in-home caregivers, programs that some families aren't even able to access because they've been on a wait list for years. Agencies in the developmental services sector who haven't seen a base funding increase in over a decade still do not have their annualized budgets seven months after the fiscal year began. They're completely in the dark about the future of their funding. The acting premier co-chaired a committee that determined five years ago that the families were, quote, being pushed to the brink of disaster. How can she continue five years later to purposefully cause anxiety and chaos Question. for Ontarians with disabilities and the people that support them? Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that we are committed to working with all those in this sector to ensure that we're actually helping the families that need the help. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, I sat with the member in her own riding and talked to those families. I understand the challenges that they are facing. They are the same challenges that they have been facing in this sector for the last 10 to 15 years, and the previous Liberal government did nothing when it came to this file. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the challenges. We we are spending $2.6 billion in this sector now in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but we know we can do so much better. And that's why we have hired the services of an outside firm while at the same time meeting with those who are providing the services in Ontario to ensure that we are going to get the investment and the better outcomes that these individuals deserve. The wait list has grown and grown Response. and grown. Under the leadership of the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, we're going to do something about it to make it better to help these families get the services that they need. Thank you. The next question, member for Niagara West. Two weeks ago, the minister stood in this house and explained the ways which, in which data has the potential to be a limitless resource for jobs and economic growth in this province. Mr. Speaker, the minister was absolutely right. And the minister was also right to point out the massive potential of the data economy needs to be nurtured, and we need to ensure that the personal information of Ontarians is protected. Minister, could you explain how Ontarians have had the opportunity to have their say in the provincial data strategy through your consultations, and can you tell us more about what our government has been doing to ensure that the people and business owners of this province are having their voices heard on this important issue? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. 
And I want to thank the member from Niagara West for his thoughtful question because everyone needs to be assured in this province that our government is focused on creating jobs and growing businesses. And the data economy is the industry where we can expect massive growth. Mr. Speaker, that's why our government is well on its way to launching its first-of-its-kind provincial data strategy that will help foster economic growth, protect the data of Ontarians, and enable smarter, more accessible government. We know that business leaders and community members across this province know best, and that's why I'm very pleased at the results of our consultations that we've had across Ontario. We've consulted with people and business leaders in Toronto, Stratford, Ottawa, Peterborough, most recently in Sarnia and Sault Ste. Marie as well. I want to thank my colleagues for helping out with those consultations, and I'd like to give a shout out to my Response. parliamentary assistant, Bob Bailey, for the great work he's doing. Hey, 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 but I'd like to assure everyone they can also participate in engaging. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for the response. I, I want to thank the Minister for her answer and also for giving Ontarians the opportunities to have their voices heard when it comes to the development of the first ever provincial data strategy in Canada. Uh, truly groundbreaking. I know that many Ontarians were glad to have been given the chance to meet with you and your staff and other members of this government to discuss how our government can ensure economic growth in the data economy is also keeping their personal data safe. Minister, you've spoken in this House about some of the elements that will form the basis of the provincial data, uh, data strategy, including things like the minister's task force. Could you please provide an update to this House about the work that has been undertaken so far by the minister's digital and data task force thus far, and can you tell us more about the next steps for this task force? Minister. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to share with everyone the appointment of our, my minister's digital and data task force is a critical part in the development of our overall provincial data strategy. The task force is another way in which our government is listening to people. Our government is giving business leaders, academic experts and world-class practitioners the opportunity to bring their experience and their valuable insight to the policy-making process. Since meeting for the first time in July, our task force has been meeting regularly and we're going to be assessing and making concrete recommendations in, in response to the consultations that we've had, and I look for forward to reporting back on this very important initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.